we've been going through this new series. This will be part three of our grounded series. And what we're kind of what we mean by that when we say grounded is how can we be grounded in faith, in Christ, and in the Word in this crazy season of all all kinds of uncertainty, all kinds of unknown things that are happening right now. How can we be grounded in those things? And so um, this will be part three, like I said. And so part one, if you guys remember a couple weeks ago, we had Laura share, started off the Grounded series where she talked about the life of Joseph and how through the trials and the hardships that he experienced, he was able to remain grounded in his faith, grounded in Jesus to stick through all of those things. So that was part one, the first week. And then we saw last week, Joe did an amazing job where we talked about how important it is and how crucial it is that we remain grounded in the Word of God, that we are consistently reading um, and, and meditating on the Word, on letting those things soak into our hearts and into our minds. So that was last week, and now we are here in part three for this week, where I want to focus in on um, another, I guess, aspect, I guess you could say, of what it means to be grounded in Christ. And what the, what I'm going to be focusing on tonight is um, the hope that we have when we are grounded in Christ and what that means for us, not only in this season, but as we journey and as we walk um, through life. And so I just have a few points that I want to share with you from Scripture um, tonight. So I would encourage you, if you do um, have a Bible next to you, I would encourage you to open it up to Romans chapter 5. That's where we're going to be hanging out, chilling out tonight. I'll give you guys a second, if you do, to just open that up real quick. Romans chapter 5, I'm going to be reading verses 1 through uh, 5. So if you've got it open, awesome. If not, that's okay. I'm going to go ahead and read it for you. So Romans chapter 5, verse 1, and it says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but... We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. So that's a kind of the, the um, little paragraph, short couple of verses that we're going to be focusing in on tonight talking about like i said again what it means to be grounded in christ and the hope that we have um, when we are so i want to go ahead and jump back to the beginning where i read and um, talked about we're going to be starting in verse two this time um, where it says through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So I'm going to take a minute and kind of break that down um, and, and explain that a little bit and tell you what that means. So if we look at the context, the overall context of the book of Romans, we know that Paul is the author of Romans. He also wrote a couple of other New Testament books. Um, and so when writing Romans, he was writing to um, the Christian believers in Rome. And what was happening at that time in that context in Rome was both the Jews and Gentiles were struggling with understanding that the way to Jesus was not by, by works. It was not by the law, but rather it was by faith. And so that still remains the same today. Today we are still saved by our, our, uh, our faith in Jesus. It's not our works. It's not by all of the things that we can do with our hands and our feet, but rather our heart remaining faithful in our hearts to him. And so as we look back again at this verse uh, 2 that I read, this means that through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we have access into this grace. Now, what does this grace mean? This grace, uh, to, to kind of explain it, means like, oh, it's like a realm. So imagine a realm of grace where this grace is where we experience the forgiveness. So when we as believers put our faith in Jesus and we accept him into our hearts, we are in that realm of grace where we experience the forgiveness of our sins, where we experience freedom in Christ. Um, and, and it says 
this grace is in which in which we stand so this is where as believers we stand we stand in that realm of grace of forgiveness and we have access to that by faith it's not by works it's not by what we do or upholding the law but it's by faith and then to, to continue and read and look at the rest of verse 2 it says and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God so what does it mean the glory of God what does it mean to have that hope or we rejoice in hope of the glory of God what that means is um, is his return so that glory of God means when Christ and um, is going to return um, we know that God promises us um, that he is going to return and we can have what's called um, is 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 this kind of hope that's really an eternal hope. So it's not really a present hope, but it's an eternal hope, meaning that in this life as we journey, we know that as we have faith in Christ, we know where we stand as believers. We have that hope that not only in this life, but the life to come, we will be able to experience eternity with him, knowing that one day Christ is going to return. He's going to fulfill his promise to return to love and, and love his people and to bring them um, to a new heavens and new earth where we can experience um, eternity with him. And so as we are grounded in Christ, we have to remember the eternal hope and his promise to return where we will get to spend eternity with God. So that's really the first big point. Um, one of two points that I've got for you tonight. That first one is that eternal hope that when we are grounded in Christ, we're grounded in relationship and we know that where we stand as believers, that we are forgiven, um, that we can experience that freedom in relationship with him. We have that eternal hope for this life, but then the life to come. So that's the big first point that I wanted to talk to you guys about, and we'll move into, continue looking at the next verse, which is verse 3, uh, 3 through 5, actually, and where it says, not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So if we go ahead and take a look at that, this brings me to my second point. My second point is this. Being grounded in Christ means to remain hopeful in the present, even in the midst of suffering. So to give you guys kind of like a, a real life story of what this looks like. I'm going to share a personal story, a little bit of my testimony about where I have kind of experienced this in my own life. And this will take us back um, to about a year ago um, when I, it was a year ago in April where I actually was in the hospital. I was in the hospital for the first time um, in my life. This is the first time I've always had like this weird, like, nervousness about hospitals like I was always kind of scared of them I always knew that if I was in a hospital it was for something not good like you don't really just go to a hospital to go and hang out you know it's kind of like one of those things well if you're in the hospital that's not really a good thing that's not a place you want to be so I always had this weird fear so this was my first time in the hospital ever and what had happened was is my appendix had actually burst and now I didn't know this at the time but um, I was actually um uh, in the hospital, in the waiting room, getting checked out. Um, I went through and I did my scan um, because the pain was just so bad. Um, I knew that my appendix had burst. And so I got the scan and I was laying there. And what actually happened was, is I had to wait. Um, if I remember right, I had to wait a, quite a, like a couple of hours in this hospital waiting to actually be transferred to another hospital because the hospital that I was in, they it was not the location where they did um, the procedure to have the appendix removed. So I had to wait. So while I was waiting to be able to help with the pain, um, because the pain was just so intense, it was constant pain that was on a scale of one to 10 was at least a nine um, all of the time. They gave me pain medicine, of course, to help. And so the first thing that had happened was is the nurse decided to give me what was what's called morphine. Now, morphine, if you have any idea what that is, that's a pretty powerful um, pain medicine. And so she had given me a dose of this pain medicine, and about 15 minutes goes by, and I experience no change in pain. My pain was still the exact same, um, and 15 minutes later, I had taken it, 
and it, it was still absolutely a nine or a ten. And so she kind of, the nurse kind of asked me. She was like, "Okay, how's your pain?" And I said, "It hasn't changed at all. I still, I couldn't sit still. Um, it was difficult just because the pain was so much." Um, and she goes, okay, well, we'll give you something else. She decided to up her game big time. She decided to take the pain medicine of morphine and take and give me something that is 10 times stronger than morphine, 10 times stronger. And I don't know if you, maybe if you've heard of it, but it's called Dilaudid. Like I said, it's 10 times stronger than morphine. So she gave me a dose of that. And next thing I know is, um, she gives me that dose. I, I, she kind of tells me I'm gonna feel a sensation in my shoulders. I felt this weird sensation in my shoulders, so I knew that it had worked. And a couple minutes goes by, the nurses and everyone leaves the room. At this point, it's me and my mother, and I start to feel the pain get less. But I, and so as this happened, I started to feel less and less pain. And finally, I was like, yes, this is my moment to go to sleep. Because I hadn't slept in 30 plus hours. It was a over like, it was like I said, it was over a two day span of me going through this pain, not knowing what was going to happen. That was, this was my second time in the ER trying to figure out what happened because the first time I went, they couldn't exactly diagnose what was going on. So I decided to go home second time. I take this medicine. I'm like, yes, I can sleep. This is my moment. So I close my eyes thinking that's what I was doing. But uh, as a couple minutes go by, um, what happens was my, my mom actually later had to explain this to me. Um, what I was doing was not going to sleep. I closed my eyes and that was all I remember um, before I woke up. I woke up um, what had to have been only a couple minutes later to like seven nurses plowing into the room that we were in. Um, one of them goes and goes over and kind of like distracts and talks to my mom or like all the other ones like surround my bed and one of the ladies was like tapping on my chest it was very weird but they were tap one of them was like tapping on my chest saying my name saying hello like how are you doing how are you feeling and I'm sitting there like bruh why did you just wake me up like that I was go I was sleeping and you just woke me up by busting into the room like that I was like man that is so rude but what was actually happening was is my body was shutting down my body was actually, I almost overdosed. I almost lost my life in that moment because of the amount of pain medicine, the dose that had been given to me was too much. I had been given way too much in such a short amount of time that my body was giving up. I couldn't handle that. It was too much. And so I was later told by my mother that it looked like I was dead. Like my face was pale. My lips were purple and blue. Like it looked like I, there was no life in me. Um, and if you can kind of just imagine like a movie that you've seen where there's a, a dead person that has been sitting there for a little bit where, you know, the face is just pale, the lips are blue, like you know that they're not there. That is exactly what I looked like. And I later was also told that uh, my mom tried to say my name while I looked like this and I was unresponsive. I don't remember her ever saying my name. All I remember was closing my eyes and opening them to the nurses coming in. Um, and so uh, I was also told that my oxygen levels had dropped to uh, 60. Now I'm not a doctor, I don't know measurements, but I was told, I don't know exactly what that means, but I was told that the lowest you ever want your oxygen levels is um, 80 and mine were at 60 mine were I was 20 levels below where um, you absolutely ever want the oxygen levels in your body to ever be I was so far beyond that and that was actually when your oxygen levels are at 60 that is where they see a lot of oxygen levels with people who actually do overdose from like drugs like cocaine and all heroin and that stuff that's where their oxygen levels get um, and then you know if you don't have enough oxygen in your body your body just shuts down and so this was an intense moment. Um, my body was shutting down. Um, my body was ready to quit. Um, and so if you can imagine what this experience um, happening to me, I went on to recover just fine um, physically, 
uh, took like about a month, which was a little bit longer than normal, just because my appendix had actually burst and I had like an infection in my stomach. Um, but physically, I was able to recover just fine. I'm doing great today. Uh, you know, a year later, I've had no issues. Usually, you don't. Um, but, but the bigger thing and the thing that took longer to recover was mentally. I mean, when you have an experience like that where in a moment, in a snap, and literally me just closing my eyes, that was all I did. I almost lost my life. And so mentally kind of recovering from that, um, having this experience took much longer. And I can remember that in that season as I recovered and in those couple of days where I was like experiencing that immense pain in my stomach and just in my body, I remember that I never stopped praying and I never stopped believing that God was going to heal me. And I believe that today, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that when my body was ready to give up, that when I closed my eyes, my body was ready to throw in the towel, raise the white flag, completely give up and be done. That in that moment, because I was consistent in my prayer, because I was grounded in Jesus and in Christ, that I believed that and had a hope that God was going to heal me. That in that moment, when my eyes were closed and my body was shutting down, that God breathed into my body and, and spoke life and brought me back and saved me by his grace in that moment. And I believe that beyond a shadow of a doubt. And, and as, you, as you can imagine in that moment and in that season afterwards, as I was recovering and reflecting on that um, moment, that um, I just imagined the depth and the level and the width and the height of God's grace for not only just me in my life, but also for other people's life as well. That that grace is meant to be experienced for not only just me, but for everybody as well. And so, as you can probably imagine, that, that moment, that experience produced endurance in me. That endurance that when something like this happens again, I'm ready, I'm, I'm consistent, I'm grounded in Jesus. And I know that if I remain faithful and I pray and believe and have hope in Jesus, that something is going to change, something will. So it produced endurance. Like scripture says, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. So that suffering I, I experienced through that moment, I, I experienced um, and, and endurance was created in me. Then through that endurance, um, it says, and endurance produces character. And that character in me was what I was kind of talking about where um, I understand to a deeper level that grace um, that, that is experienced um, for not only just me, but for others. And I can share that with others. And so um, through that character, then it says further on, um, that character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. And this is just one story um, of many. I'm pretty sure and I can imagine that each of you watching right now can kind of think of a moment or a time or a season um, where you have experienced something maybe similar, where you experienced something of, a, of suffering, something of a trial, a hardship, a difficulty. Um, and so I just want to encourage you um, to remember and know that um, God has proven and will prove himself to be faithful even in the midst of suffering. And so uh, even in the midst of, uh, to encourage you, to even in the midst of the hardships, the trials, when we're battling things like depression, when we know someone maybe, maybe it's not even us, but we know someone who's battling um, anxiety, someone who's battling cancer, someone who's going through or walking through the loss of a loved one. We know that through those things, as we continue to be grounded in Christ and have that hope in our present suffering, that God will be faithful um, to prove himself. And we know that God will be you know, faithful to prove himself, that he is who he says he is, that he is a God of love, that he has a God of peace and strength and joy. And he will prove himself to, to um, faithful to us. And we can expect something to happen. We can expect something to change in our situation. But here's the thing, um, to remain grounded in him, that means we have to remain spending time with him. That means reading the word of God. That means spending time in praise and in worship and, and um, really just speaking and, and meditating um, the, the promises, on the promises in the word of God through worship music, meditating on those promises that God is who he says he is. 
And so if we look at verse uh, 5, um, let's take a look at it, finish up these couple of verses. It says, And hope does not put us to shame, uh, but here's, hey, listen to this, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So how do we experience this love um, that, that's being talked about, that we have experienced, that's been poured out? And it's through relationship with him. That is how we experience this, this love. We have to be grounded in relationship with him to have the hope that is not only just an eternal hope, but a hope of, of the present suffering that we're experiencing. And we can rejoice in both of those things, knowing that God is faithful, God is there, God is present, he is near. And as we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. And so we just take a look real quick as I'm kind of finishing up, um, as we look at both the, the two main points, the eternal hope and the present hope, I want to just take a look at real quick at the end here, um, just the actual definition of hope. And so the actual definition of hope is, um, let me see, I got to find it in my notes because it was up earlier, but I, I passed right by it, of course. Uh, where did it go? Okay, here we go. The definition of hope. Let's read this. It's a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. So really that definition literally exactly talks about the two points that we talked about tonight. That the first thing, a feeling of expectation, goes along with that present hope that we have, that through um, the, the trials, through the hardships, through the struggles in life that we have, um, the ups and even the downs, we have that present hope that uh, um, it's a feeling of expectation. We can expect God to be faithful in that situation. And then moving on, it says, and desire for a certain thing to happen. That's talking, we can say that's talking about the eternal hope that we have um, that, and that thing to happen is the return of Jesus. That we desire that thing, we have hope and we wait for that thing to happen knowing, like I said earlier, that God has promised us to return to his people um, and so we can have that hope and that's just the definition um, and it fits, I thought it fit absolutely perfect for what we were talking about tonight. So tonight, I hope that encourages you. I hope you maybe need to write down those two main points of, of what it means to have hope as we're grounded in Christ. We can have hope in both of those things. Um, and so I hope that it encourages you guys. I'm going to go ahead and pray real quick. And then we'll go ahead and get ready um, to do the drawing for tonight's winner of a $5 gift card. So I hope that sounds good. So I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we'll go ahead and do that. So Father God, Lord, I just thank you for tonight. Father, I thank you for this time. And I hope and pray that even though as we're doing this um, through a live stream, Father, I hope and pray that, Holy Spirit, that you spoke. Father, you spoke to every heart and every mind of every person who's listening and tuning in right now, Father. And that right now in this season, God, wherever they may be at, God, that you would fill them with hope. That you would help them and remind them to be grounded in you. And as they're grounded in relationship with you, as they're grounded in um, spending time with you, as they're grounded in reading your word and meditating on your promises, Father, that they can have hope in, um, as an eternal hope of, of the return of you, Jesus. And not only that, Father, but we can have a hope in our present suffering that as we go through the things that we go through, we are not alone because it says in your word in Romans chapter five, verse five, in the end, it says your Holy Spirit has been given to us. And by faith, we have access to you and we can um, experience relationship with you, Holy Spirit. So, Father, I pray that as we go, um, as we go about our weeks and our days, God, that you would um, fill us, fill us more with your hope in Jesus mighty name. We pray. Amen.